Hello, my name is Greg Grinklaw, and today we are going to enter a new imaging system into Sky Tools 4. So I'm going to go up to the Setup tab, click on Imaging Systems. Now when you enter this information, it's important to get it as accurate as possible. If you f later on find out that the field of view doesn't quite match or the performance doesn't quite match, it's because something isn't entered accurately in here. So I can't emphasize that enough. There's no new button here, at least not yet, so I'm going to start by picking a random imaging system and clicking clone. That will create a copy of that imaging system that I had selected in order to have default values. First thing I'm going, going to do is enter the name. This is going to be the Redonda Observatory TPO. Next I'm going to enter the type of imaging system and that's pretty much how it's used. In this case it's a private system which means you have complete access, access to it all night long. Um, if, it's, if it's say an eye telescope you would select shared by time slot and we're going to go with private system. The next thing to do is to enter the actual telescope part, the optical tube assembly. Normally all of your telescopes would be listed here. I have a lot of them. Um, but when we want to enter a new one, we're going to click on the gear here, which will bring up the dialog for creating a new telescope optical tube assembly. Now I'm going to click on new. And here is a list of telescopes pre-entered into the software. Unfortunately, there aren't any TPOs in there yet, but that's okay. They're easily entered. I'm going to click on enter manually and select OK. There are only a few parameters for a telescope. I'm going to put in TPO 12 inch. The telescope type, the optical design is an RC. I'm going to flip this to millimeters. The aperture was 305 millimeters. And it's normally an F8, but we went ahead and installed a 0.75 times focal reducer, which brought it down to 1830 millimeters or F6. Now since we've installed a focal reducer in here, I'm going to click this box, which says that there is a built-in focal changer. That just tells the system there's one more piece of glass. The orientation should be unmodified. Optics are set to a little dir dirty. It doesn't matter what you set that for because for an imaging system, that's not used. When I entered the, the RC system up here, it estimated the central obstruction at 39%, but I looked it up for this telescope and it's actually a whopping 48%. So I'm going to enter that, click done, and we've now entered our optical tube assembly. The next thing to do is our camera. And this is the camera that's attached to this telescope. I can modify it. It will, it will remember the, the data. If I click on your cameras, here's a list of all the tele cameras that I have created and modified and attached to different telescopes. Normally, you're just going to have one or two here, um, but in testing, I have quite a few. To add a new camera, we're going to go over here to get camera from the pool. That's the list of cameras that were shipped with the telescope. Eventually, you're going to be able to download these from our website and share them to the website. And I'm hoping that will allow us to keep up much better with new cameras as they come along. So the camera we're looking for is an STL6303. I'm going to click Use This Camera. And now it's imported the data. I'm going to go over some of these values quickly. The pedestal is an arbitrary number that cameras add to the signal output. And that's so when you're doing calibration, you don't get a negative value. Now some, some cameras will, won't do this, and software is needed to do it for you. But in most cases, for modern cameras, they add this pedestal value, and it's almost always 100. Over here, we have the full well. These values here in this box are used to calculate when Saturation is going to occur when blooming is going to occur. So it's a good idea to get these things accu as accurate as possible. These are all specs you can look up for any CCD camera. 
So the full well here is set in electrons to 100,000 electrons, more than that, and it's going to start spilling over and saturate. It's linear up to 5,000 ADU. Now this isn't electrons. This is actual counts coming out of the camera. Above 50,000 ADU, it's no longer linear. And what that means if you're doing photometry, signals above that may no longer give you accurate photometry. So that's an important number to know for photometry. If this camera had an anti-blooming gate, <coughs> excuse me, you would check this box and enter a number here, something like 100,000. Something else you can look up. It doesn't have one, so I'm going to disable it. This is empty. I'm going to put 0.3 electrons per second. Now, these things are all easily looked up in the specs for a CCD camera. Down here, we have the quantum efficiency. Now, often you can just look up the detector from our list here, and that will enter the quantum efficiency. But in this case, it's been entered manually. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So here's the graph for, for, for this camera. This is quantum efficiency. It's, ab it's absolute quantum efficiency versus wavelength. So at 400 nanometers, it's 30%. And so we go over here to 400 nanometers, and we enter 30. Now, you can tell relative quantum efficiency from absolute quantum efficiency because relative quantum, quantum efficiency will peak at 100. But rather than, say, 65 like we see here, these specs are also available for most any astronomical CCD camera. It's pretty easy to enter it yourself. If there is an op a built-in guider chip, you would enable this. Enter the numbers. Again, more specs you can look up. And I'm going to go ahead and click Done. When I do that, this camera I've modified for this telescope is now going to be saved in my Your Cameras list for, so I can call it up later. Okay, so the last thing in this main section here is the type of mount. I'm going to put in a German Equatorial. So this here defines our imaging system. And if you changed any of these things, you'd have to, you, you're changing the imaging system. So, for instance, if you change the camera, if you have more than one camera and you swap them out on the same telescope or the same imaging system, then you're going to have to create a second imaging system for that second camera. Our next uh, item here is optical configuration. You would normally set this to normal and that would be for both refractors and reflectors. The one, that, what this means for primary focus rather than prime focus is that's the place which you, where you would normally install the camera. At the back end of a refractor, at the back end of a Cassegrain, at uh, the Newtonian focus for a Newtonian telescope. That is all primary focus. Prime focus is where your primary mirror or lens focuses the light. If, for instance, you take out your secondary mirror and you install a hyperstar, then you would be putting that at the prime focus. But almost always, this is going to be at the primary focus. If you somehow have focal reducers and extenders that you swap in and out, you would add them here. Click Add. Let's say it's a 0.5 times focal reducer, 2-inch barrel, click OK. It's now added to the list. This would be something you could select from within the software. And you can add as many as you want. I'm going to delete it because this is imaging system doesn't actually have one. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the mirror efficiency here. And it turns out that in our testing, the last time the mirror was clean, for a reflecting telescope uh, made a big difference on how much signal we were getting. So we take that into account in our models. I'm going to enter the last date when this system was clean. It's uh, relatively new, so I'm going to put in December 1st of last year. The secondary was, was cleaned at the same time, so it's, I'm going to click Same. And then I'm going to click the Advanced button here. Now this is the Mirror Degradation Coefficient 
we're going to just leave that at 6,000. These values here were set up from the last imaging system, the one we cloned. And what these values do is they sort of tweak the imaging system um, to, to get very exact performance for each of your filters. And I will be releasing a utility program that will um, allow you to analyze images of a Landolt standard star field to calculate these numbers for your telescope. But at this point, we're going to set them all to none. So make sure they're all none. And each one should be one. Now, down here, this is another important parameter. This is the best full width at half max you have observed with this particular imaging system. So high in the sky on a night of excellent seeing, this particular telescope never seems to get better than one and a half arc seconds in the full width of half max. So we're going to put that in here. That tells Sky Tools to um, assume that it's never going to get better than that. And this is, this is a function of the optical system. Um, so even on the best night of seeing, it's going to bottom out at 1.5 arc seconds. And I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Next down here, we entered a location for Mesa Redonda Observatory. So I'm going to select that here. We did that in an earlier video. Now, if this was a telescope that was moved around, we would clear this box and you will be able to select it in the software. But since it is a fixed observatory, I'm going to go ahead and click Fixed. Now, over on this side, we have uh, an external op an external guider, an off-axis guider, actually. I'm going to click Enable. And I'm going to enter the radius around um, the s optical axis that this guider sits at. And it's about between 15 and 25 arc minutes. Now, this is something that I'm going to be working on. It's not really finished. I have not come up with a, a way to specify the actual position of the guider in a rotational sense relative to the camera field of view. Uh, I wish to talk to you guys about that. We're going to go ahead and enter these numbers, which will create a ring. And you can drag the field of view around and um, if eventually put a guide star in the proper position. There's no eyepiece projection for this telescope or this, this imaging system, so we're going to skip that. Here's the camera configuration. I'm going to set the angle to zero. It has a rotator, so I'm going to remove this checkbox where it says fixed. If you have a camera that is in a fixed rotation angle, put the rotation angle in here and click fixed. If it moves around a little bit from time to time, you can go ahead and just update this number. Here we have the maximum bidding. Uh, at various points in the software, it will estimate the best bidding to use for different situations, different objects. This sort of gives it a cap not to go over. Um, so if I set it to four by four, it would only choose one, two, three, or four by four bidding. I'm gonna leave it at two, point, two by two. Uh, next, we're going to set up the filters. So these filters here, were part of the other system, or perhaps the last time I made this video. So we're going to reassign filters from the list here on the left. And you can choose your filters or get filters from the pool. And again, as we saw earlier, your filters are ones you've already set up and used in a camera. So that might be blank. The pool are the ones that are shipped with Sky Tools. And this has a generation one luminance. I'm going to double click green. I can click the assign as well. Blue and red. It also has an H alpha, an O3, and a photometric visual filter. Okay, so now we've assigned our filters to the telescope. Doesn't really matter what the order is. We're going to look at uh, one here to see what they look like. So this is how filters work in Sky Tools. It's an actual digital profile of the trans, uh, 
transmission of the filter versus wavelength. This value here is important. This has to match what ACP has for that filter. If it says luminance, you need for it to say luminance there, or ACP won't know what filter you're talking about. This is the full uh, name of the filter, and this is the abbreviation that's used in the software. Now, I do have a digitizer that I will be making available so you can digitize an image that shows this graph, and you can pick the values off to um, enter new filters of your own. And it's not working yet, but I am also going to allow you to read pairs of wavelengths and transmission values from a file. But for the time being, if there's a filter you use that's not already in SkyTools, tell me and I will create it for you um, so you can use it. Okay, so that's filters, clicking OK, clicking OK. Now, there aren't any lenses in this kind of system, so I'm just going to leave that blank. Onto exposure times. There's two ways to set up exposure times. One is with a range of expo allowed exposures, and the other is with a list of allowed exposures. So uh, the list would mean, let's say, you do your calibrations for certain specific exposure times, say 60 seconds. Let's go ahead and put one in your 60 seconds. And maybe for uh, 120 seconds, 3 minutes, and 5 minutes, you want to limit your actual exposures to the same values, then you would use this and tell it what the allowed sub exposures are, and Sky Tools will keep to those. Or you can come up here, which is what we're going to do, and set a range. In this case, it's going to be from 1 to 10 minutes. So Sky Tools won't generally pick anything outside of that. I'm probably going to change this so you can select seconds eventually. Um, but even now, it will allow for shorter exposures in special cases. Uh, for instance, let's say you're not tracking an asteroid, and it's going to smear in, say, 27 seconds, then, then it will allow you to do a 27-second exposure, even though this says one minute. So the next thing here is the automation. We're going to configure that. Um, this is set up for a generic ACP controller controlled system. It does have an auto guider. It does have focus max, so auto focus, and it has a camera rotator. Now click OK there. And lastly, we set up the timings. Um, this is how long it takes for each of these things to happen. So Sky Tools can estimate how long it's going to take to finish your observations and keep everything on schedule. So it's important to have these fairly close. Uh, these slew rates here aren't the specifications from the manufacturer for the mount because, you know, they speed up and they slow down. Um, a short slew is going to run at a different speed than a long slew and so forth. So what these values are, in practice, it works pretty well to, to just use an overall mean so these values are the average time that it takes to do a slew, whether it be a short slew or a long slew, um, the average speed that it slews at. And I will also release a utility program that analyzes ACP logs to calculate these numbers for you. So we've got the rotation rate. We've got everything set up here. I'm going to click OK. And that sets everything up. Now we're going to do one last thing, we're going to save our imaging system by clicking Save here. Now, there's a, an important reason for this. During our testing, I may require you to do a clean install, and when you do that, you're going to lose your imaging system and the camera and all that, and you don't want to do that. So anytime you've make any, made any changes here, go ahead and save it to a SkyTools SDX file by clicking this button. Don't worry about these values here. You just leave those unchecked. And that will save your imaging system to a file. Store it someplace where you can find it, 
like maybe in your um, document. Do not put it in your Sky Tools 4 folder because that's the folder that I'm going to have you delete if we do a clean install. So make sure and save this and if you make changes, save it again. Uh, later on we'll be using the open button here to read it in if necessary. And you'll get everything back just the way it was before assuming everything works properly. Okay, so that is everything for setting up your imaging system.